Hey, Charlotte, welcome to Rhea Power Hour. Um, first Thank of all, um, give me a little bit of information about you, uh, who you are, where you're calling from. Um, I'm Charlotte Parsons. I'm calling from Maui. Uh, I had a stroke a year, a little over a year ago. Uh, affected my right side is, and I am right dominant. Currently, I've had rehab ever since, and currently I'm learning how to write again. Okay. Uh, tried my left hand for a while, but that was really ugly. I'm trying to learn with my right hand again. Sure. Um, my, I've been looking at Modus Nova okay. online. This is the second time I've come to your power hour. Yep. My big questions are, does the use of it help strengthen the quad, the foot mentor? Does it help strengthen quad muscles or glute muscles? Okay. And does the hand mentor help work the shoulder, help the shoulder muscles? Because that seems to be where my biggest problems are. Sure, sure. Good questions. So first things first, as I did um, in the in a past uh, past guests with uh, with Cheryl, I guess two guests passed. I'll always start with the evidence um, and we'll build up from that. So Charlotte, the, it's a good one. When we talk about the modus foot, have we evaluated the direct strength measures of people's quads? The answer, no, we have not done that. Um, those, those data do not exist. Um, now, with that being said, when we look at what we have evaluated, and that's mostly gait, walking speed and walking endurance. Those measures we know are improving following a three month period of using the modus foot for around an hour and a half a day, five days a week. So kind of that, around that 100 to 130 hour range, we kind of get, um, we see those, those doubling of walking endurance and a, and a doubling of walking speed. So with that, we- What about gait improvement? Do you see any, um, like I can, I'm learning to use the quad cane right now. Okay. But it's- my gait is really not coordinated and it's sure. that would make it difficult. Sure, sure. Yeah, and yeah, that we do see gait improvements, right? So when we actually see people go in terms of increases in what are called functional categories, when you look at the way we qualify gait patterns, there is one way to measure these and there's kind of a three categories pattern. There's called a limited home ambulator, there's a, or as a home ambulator, there's a limited community ambulator, and the top is an unlimited community ambulator. Following Are you talking the, about the person is the ambulator? Correct. Like yes, I, exactly. Okay. All right. Yep. yep. That's Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah, yeah, no, no. These are, these are scientific terms, clinical terms that we use to, uh, to qualify and sort of characterize people's gait patterns and their, their sort of capacity to, to have um, purposeful gait and, and makes sense. successful gait. And what we actually see is we see people jump categories, functional categories. So if someone is a home ambulator, meaning they can only walk around in their home safely, they're not able to go out in the community, they're able to actually jump up a functional category and become a, a limited functional ambulator in the community. And those are really meaningful things, right? You're much safer yes. to walk around. Yeah, so those are really meaningful improvements. So we do see those, those changes that are consistent with improved gait. Now, what's kind of encoded in this, I'm, I'm kind of dancing around the question that have we evaluated that quad strength? No, we haven't done that. But when we look at the sort of broad functional patterns, the thing that actually matter, right? Being able to walk successfully and safely and fast enough to operate in the community, those things are improving. That's the kind of where the rubber meets the road. And so it's very similar to your next question, which is, do we see improvements up the sort of kinematic chain up into the elbow and the shoulder? And this is a, is a good one here. And this is actually one of the justifications for why we actually focus on the distal parts of the extremities, um, both the hand and the foot. And when we do this, when we focus on the hand and the foot, well, I guess the wrist and the hand and the foot and the ankle, we do see improvements sort of traveling up the kinematic chain. Um, and when, why that's the case is because when you start to get more capacity to say, for instance, operate my hand to successfully open up an aperture and basically manipulate things, I'm more likely to use my hand and therefore my upper extremity in daily life. And therefore what happens is all those sort of daily activities become your, your actual sort of rehab. And then ultimately that kind of snowballs. You do more and more movements during daily life and then you get back to normal functioning. So that's one of the reasons why we actually see sort of those changes go up the chain. 
so that kind of parlays into your next question about the upper extremity. Yeah, we do see improvements in the shoulder and shoulder and elbow function. Um, and we do these, um, these, these interventions, it's a little bit surprising actually to see those when we were just focusing on the wrist and the hand, right? This relatively simple sort of um, movement. Why would we see improvements in the upper extremity? And that's for that simple reason. There's two real sort of underlying drivers. The one is the, is the, uh, the first one rather is the one I just described. And that is sort of this positive feedback loop of getting more capacity of our end effectors, our hands and our feet allows us to use them more in daily life. And when we do them, when we do more movements in daily life, we sort of get this sort of snowball effect of positive, um, positive feedback loops. The other really, really cool thing is more about the neural physiology, right? How these, ner these neural circuits are actually structured in our brain. You know, some people may have heard this term, the homunculus. It's a big fancy word that basically means there's a distribution of sort of a, a localization of the way our brains are structured and wired. Um, while there is sort of a hand area and, a, and a, uh, like an arm area, if you actually peer down some really beautiful work from Georgeopolis and um, 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 that those groups back in the kind of early 2000s and early uh, late 1990s, they actually discovered that the neurons are not so um, centralized. It's not like you have a cluster of just hand neurons here. They're actually structured in a group. They're structured in functional groups. So you actually have a hand neuron and a sort of a, a fingers neuron that are kind of jointly um, localized. So when you have them locally dispersed like this, you end up getting more synchronous activation. And so when you get this sort of synchronous activation during the tasks, doing something like a hand and wrist movement, you get that synchronous activation of the neurons that control the upper extremity. So there's kind of those two drivers that cause those improvements to go up the chain. Interesting. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. And it's taken a long time to understand that, but you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon and, and rather surprising, but it's, it's a happy outcome of, of the cases. Okay, um, the reason I re really was asking, especially about the glute muscles is that I, am, I have a lot of trouble like just standing to accomplish sure. anything because I keep collapsing on yep. the right side. Yep. And of course I'm better than I was. So, <laughs> sure. And you're saying, if I understand you correctly, that it could impact that for the good. Yeah, it could very much so. I think if you look at sort of the first principles of it, you're exactly right in terms of it's working on the gastrocnemius muscles and the soleus muscles and the tibialis anterior. Those muscles are the ones that help move our. I'll just I'll just stand up here and do it with you guys. So, I'll put my my foot right here. Our tibialis anterior muscle is the one that runs here. And that's right. the one that goes from pointing our toes to go up. And our gas are the ones down here that go point down. So if you look at the actual hardware of the modus foot, it focuses on those individual muscles, right? So by nature of doing those specific activations, you're not necessarily going to get glute activation, but by nature of you really engaging that left or your, 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 um, um, your right side, um, it's going to cause activation of those other segments. And so um, it's, it's sort of indirect effects, most likely. Um, it's not the direct effect of you moving your foot and ankle up and down. It's sort of a, a secondary consequence of those, um, of those activations. Okay. Um, thank you. Of course, Charlotte. Yeah. Any other questions for me? Well, not right now, though. Maybe okay. as I goes along, I'll think of something. Thank you. Sure.